Well, today we're at the Old Schwamm Mill in Arlington, Massachusetts. Since 1864, this mill has produced picture frames, and they're most famous for their beautiful oval frames. Thanks to a preservation trust, this mill is still in operation, and you can buy a frame even today. Let's go inside. When you step into the office, it's like stepping back to 1860. On the wall, a rack with all different profiles of moldings that are available. Some of these date back over 100 years. Oh, and look at this. Mr. Schwarm's old roll-top desk with this wonderful old light hanging over it. And in the corner, his safe. Now, there are various picture frames on the wall, but the ones that they're most famous for are the oval frames. To make oval frames, you need four quadrants, and the whole process starts out here. There's a rack with lumber, and then patterns for just about every size oval you can think of. But if they don't have the oval that you want, they can lay one out using this device. Once the layout has been done on the raw material, it's brought over to the bandsaw to be roughed out. And this is quite a bandsaw. I'd love to have one of these at the New Yankee Workshop with a 36 inch throat. Now after the piece has been roughed, it's brought to a special tool for making ovals, a wooden frame that supports a wooden table and a sliding portion. The pieces of the frame are mounted with various stops and then the table is pushed to trim it in exactly the right place. Once it's trimmed, the end joints are finger jointed and then glued together. Once the glue is dried, it's brought over to the turner, Dave Graff. Hi, Dave. Hi, Norm. Show me how this works. Sure. Uh, you can see that we've, uh, we've screwed the raw frame onto the faceplate of mm -hmm. this elliptical lathe. And uh, we have a tool rest right here. Mm -hmm. That's at exactly the right height so that when you put your cutting tool here, you can cut an ellipse into your, your frame. Now, I see that you still have the old pulleys and belts to drive this equipment. I, sure I guess way back in history, it was probably water-driven, isn't that That's right? right. It was water-driven, and for a while, it was driven by a steam engine as well. Okay. Let's see it work. All right. Let me slide this pulley over onto the drive. There we go. Wow, that looks scary. It's <laughs> swinging way almost out of whack. Crazy. That's right. <laughs> On this side, it is, it is way out of whack, so to speak. But over here, where the tool rest is, you can actually cut the shape into it. And your, your tool is cutting any lips into this mm -hmm. frame as you hold it still. So that's how it works. Want to give it a shot? Sure. Okay. Well, it would take a little practice, but I think I could get it. I'm sure you could. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. Of course, you can order the frames in a variety of finishes. But over here, Andriana Rashman is supplying gold leaf. And I see you have a packet of thin right. sheets of gold. This is 22 karat gold mm -hmm. leaf. Now and we cut it with a knife. Okay. Homemade tip. And we need static so you on rub the it tip. On your face, okay. right. And we pick up the gold that right. sticks very So it nicely. doesn't turn into a ball. It stays nice and flat. Right. And you're setting it on a wet surface on the frame. Right. This is alcohol and water mm -hmm. to make the glaze activate and make it stick. Wow. Now, this is one of just many steps that you'll have to perform to get this frame totally gold leaf. But right. when it's finished, it's going to look like this one, which is beautiful. And, of course, you can still order frames like this from the mill, right? Right. But we have to wait a little while. Be patient. Right. That's a while. Now, next time you're in Arlington, Massachusetts, whether or not you need an oval frame, you must stop by the Old Swarm Mill. It's a woodworker's paradise. Now, here's my attempt at building some picture frames. I've tried several different versions, and I'll show you what I've made. I haven't set any glass in these yet because I want to finish the wood. But this particular frame is a shadow box. It's very deep. And it works well with a portrait picture like this. This is a menu from my favorite restaurant in London. I've surrounded it with matte board and a very small frame, which seems to work well. This is a piece of beveled mirrored glass, and I made a fluted frame out of oak to surround it. And here's a picture of an old house that I'm particularly fond of, and I've surrounded it with some matte board in an old time frame. Now, after making these first few frames, I must say I have a lot more respect for people in the picture framing business. Assembling the wood frame is the easy part, but picking the right frame and the right mat board for the picture, now that's art, and I'm not really an artist. Now choosing wood for the various frames, I first went to my lumber rack and pulled out some stock moldings that I have here. This is a crown molding, this is a cornice molding, and what I discovered quickly was that there's not enough wood and there's no rabbit to support the picture itself. However, I did find one molding that you can buy at the home center that will work. This is actually a picture molding that's usually placed on the wall up high. You can place a hook around this round portion and hang your pictures. I thought that if I add a piece of wood to the back side, it will give me a rabbit. It's actually quite a nice profile for a picture frame. Now this 
piece of wood here was actually part of a molding that I bought at the home center. It's sold as a decorative molding, and this is not carved, it's actually pressed in place. It comes in eight-foot lengths, and it already has a rab in it, which makes it good for making picture frames, like the one I used around this old house picture. Now, I have one more picture I want to frame with that molding. It's this one right here. It's a picture of some friends of mine in their younger day. But before I cut any wood, I want to cut the mat board. I picked up my mat board at an office supply store. And it turns out that there's an unlimited selection of colors and textures. But it seems that the basic whites work the best. So I'm going to use this one right here for our photograph. And the first thing I want to do is set the overall size of the mat. Now I want to cover this white border on the photograph with at least two inches of mat. And then I want to allow another half inch to fit into the rabbit. So that's what I'll use at the side. And I think the same at the top. But at the bottom, picture framers say we should make that a little bit wider. So I'm going to make the bottom two and three quarter inches. A good sharp utility knife, sometimes called a mat knife, is the best tool for making the overall cut. With the window laid out on the back of the mat board, I'm ready to cut it. I don't want to make the cut perpendicular because that'll leave a shadow on the artwork. I want to bevel it back. And to do that, I'm going to use a mat cutting tool. It has a very sharp blade, which I can pivot down into the work. How I set it up is I take my straight edge and place it about an eighth of an inch away from the line, bring the mat cutter to one end and against the straight edge, and plunge it down so it just hits the line to get it, to get it set up on this end. And I bring it to this end and check it. And then by securely holding the straight edge with my left hand, I come back to the beginning, plunge it down so that the little indicator mark on the tool meets the intersection, glide it along the straight edge. And then I want to overshoot this side by about an eighth of an inch. Okay, well that works great. Now with the mat board cut, we have the overall dimensions to start making the frame. Now I want to show you a foolproof method for calculating the lengths of the frame pieces. Take an actual piece of the molding and measure the width, not including the rabbit. So in this case, an inch and three sixteenths. Double that measurement because there's a piece on each side of the frame for a total of two and three eighths. Hold the two and three eighths measurement right at the edge of the mat. Come down to the other end and read what you have. So I have 20 and 13 sixteenths. I want to add a sixteenth for a little extra free play for a total of 20 and 7 eighths for the long sides of the frame. I use the same method to calculate the short sides. Now my power miter box does a real good job cutting the 45 degree angle cuts and that would probably be good enough in most situations. But here at the workshop I have the luxury of owning one of these. It's a trimmer. It has two very sharp blades that work like a guillotine. Of course, I do have to add a little extra to the length when I make the cut at the miter box to account for this trim. But believe me, that is a perfect 45 degree angle. Here's a tip. To ensure that the joints are going to fit perfectly, it's absolutely essential that opposite sides of the frame are cut to exactly the same length. To join the corners of the frame, I'm using a yellow carpenter's glue. And to secure the corner while the glue dries, I'm going to use this spring clamp. It's actually a tool that I slip on one of these springs. And then I spread it open, bring it over the corner. It'll dig into the wood and squeeze the joint together while it dries. But while this frame dries, I'll show you how I made the molding for this frame. It's a half round on the front and rabbited on the back. To make that, I'm going to be using my router shaper. And before we use any power tools, I want to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. And where applicable here in the workshop, I wear hearing protection. Now let's take a look at the cross section of that molding. The front is half round, and I want to do that first. So I've set up a bit that may look a little bit odd, but what it is is a multi-profile bit. It'll make combinations of all different profiles. To make the rabbit that's in the back of the molding, I've set up my stacked dado head cutter 
with an auxiliary fence that comes over the cutter a little bit, and installed some feather boards to hold the stock in the correct position. Now here's the subject for this frame. It's a botanical print, and the mat that I've chosen is a forest green linen type mat. And I really like the fact that when you cut the window, those angles reveal the white underneath, which really helps to offset this print. Now there's another reason for using mat board. It separates the artwork from the glass we're going to put over it. Now my frame is all ready to be glued up, except this time I'm going to use a slightly different clamping system. It's threaded rods and corner blocks. I've had it around the shop for quite some time, and it works really well. Okay, wipe off any glue that's squeezed out, and we'll set this one aside to dry. And let's mill up some stock to frame a mirror. Now to mill the flutes and the molding, I've removed the saw blade and installed a molding head cutter in my table saw. It has a series of different profile knives that can be installed. This one is a coving bit and a fluting bit. I'm only going to be using the flute section of the knife. I'm going to slide my fence over to about where it should be for the first couple flutes. And let's check the setup against my sample. And that seems to be okay. So we'll install a hold down block and we'll be ready to run the stock. Okay, well that takes care of the two center grooves. Now I'm going to move the fence and do the two outside ones. The next step is going to take place at the joiner. I want to knock off the two corners on the front edge. So I've tipped the fence on my joiner to 45 degrees and I'll just run each edge through. Next I want to make the rabbit to support the mirror. I want to remove this material right here. So again I'm going to turn to the joiner. I've adjusted the fence and the depth of the cut. It works great. This is what I'm going to frame with that fluted stock. It's a beveled mirror. It has eight sides. So that means that the cuts of the frame are going to have to be 22 and a half degrees rather than 45. Because this frame is wide enough, I'm going to reinforce the joints by installing some biscuits. These biscuits will really make these joints strong. Now to clamp all the joints tightly together, I'm using what's known as a band clamp. It's a piece of nylon tape that fits through these plastic pieces that go at each corner. And this device right here has a ratchet in it so I can tighten it right down. And once I get it set, we'll just set it aside to dry. Well, after those joints dried overnight, they're never gonna come apart. And it still fits the mirror. Now I got one more frame I want to build today. The shadow box. Now I made the frame out of pine. And if you'll notice, the mat board is beveled as well as the frame. And what that does is it brings the eye right to the artwork. If we look at a cross section of the molding, you can see that it's rabbited at the back. And here's that bevel, but it doesn't come right to a point. There's actually a little section of flat on the frame. Over at the table saw, I've tipped the blade to 20 degrees and adjusted the rip fence so it'll end up with that flat portion I just showed you. And once again, I'm going to be using pine for the frame, and I'll run it through right on the edge. Now to miter the pieces for the shadow box, I could return to my power miter box. But I'm going to use another method that's quite accurate, and it involves building a jig. I'm going to use my table saw, and I start out with a piece of hardwood that fits in my miter slot with no side play, and a piece of half-inch cabinet-grade plywood. Now I'm going to let it go beyond the blade a bit, put a pencil mark to locate the cleat, and square it up. Then I'll attach the cleat with some glue and screws. Now I want to trim off the excess plywood. I'll just raise the saw blade up, and after I've made the cut, I'll know that this edge is perfectly parallel to the blade. Now, using my framing square, I want to lay out a couple 45-degree lines to this edge. 
And I know that if I take a framing square and use a measurement from this inside corner to a measurement of, say, 11 along this leg and do the same along this leg, that I then will have perfect 45 degree angles here and here. So I'll draw a couple lines and attach some hardwood blocks with some more glue and screws. Now we'll trim the blocks back at the table saw. Okay, now there's one more thing I want to do, and that's a safety issue. I want to add a block of wood right here as a saw guard. Now we're ready to cut some moldings. If I were cutting a flat molding, I would place it in front of the forward block, pass it through the saw, and that would produce a perfect 45 degree angle. However, my shadow box molding is narrower than it is wide, and because it has this bevel, it can't be supported against the block very well. So I'm going to set it behind the block on the flat edge. I'll have to hold it a little more securely, but it'll still give me the same cut. I'll run all four pieces on one end. Now I've marked the length on the other end of the molding. And what's nice about this jig is that now, by using the back block and setting the molding in position, bringing the pencil line right to the end of the block, I know that I'm going to get the accuracy I want. Now, there are any number of corner clamps available which will help bring the joint together so that I can install some brads, which combined with the glue will hold the joint together. Now let's talk about mounting the artwork to the mat. I place the mat face down on a clean board, take the art and center it on the back side. Now I want to attach it with some tape. And this is not just ordinary tape. It's tape that's specially made for mounting pictures that I got at my paper supply store. And I only want to use enough to hold it in place because the sandwich of glass and backer board will do the rest. The glass that I'm going to use is a single strength glass that I picked up at my glass supplier. And right now I want to make sure that the inside that's going to be up against the artwork is absolutely clean. Well now for the final assembly. I've taken the frame and applied two coats of gloss polyurethane. First thing I want to do is set the glass without getting any additional fingerprints on it. That's good. Now I can take the print, set that in place. And the last thing to go on is a piece of 1 8 inch hardboard as a backer. Now I'm going to secure everything with this framer's tool, which I put up against the inside edge, hold a handle, and it drives a point that looks just like this, holding everything in place. Now, this method of hanging pictures has been around for a long time, and it still works just as well today. A couple screw eyes on each side of the frame, about a quarter to a third of the way down from the top. And then the most important thing, some braided wire. And we'll just stretch a piece across, twist it around on each end, and we'll be ready to hang the picture. All right. Yeah, that turned out pretty well. Now, once I get the rest of the frames completed, hey, we'll be ready for a gallery opening. Well, here's our collection of picture frames. Our menu with a black polyurethane finish. A picture of our friends with a gold spray paint. Our botanical has a frame that's just varnished. And this old house has a spray paint gold frame with a black stripe painted in it. Of course, over here I have the shadow box, which is a varnished finish. Our mirror with an oiled cherry. And of course, our poster from Tivoli with a white painted frame. And for some right good art to put you in your frame, try the joy of painting at nine this morning. But next, Rex Hunt Fishing Adventures from Down Under. Keep it Discovery Real Time.